starts on the bottom of page four and continues on to page five. Yes, it yeah, so starts that. with the cost shift during the 2019 UHP hearing. So in response to the question about um, what impact has the cost shift um, had on premiums, uh, we did pull the reports published by the board um, that calculates the Medicare and Medicaid reimbursements and quantifies the amount of cost shift. And so at the top of page five, uh, we compared um, the total revenue for all Vermont hospitals, what percentage of that revenue is commercial, and then um, did some calculations to um, allocate a percentage of the commercial spend um, that's attributable to the cost shift, which we um, estimate to be just under 35%. And then um, uh, Paul's team pulled together the response in this paragraph that uh, just used that uh, estimate to speak to um, maybe the middle of that following paragraph that said, you know, as the resulting calculation leads to a rate decrease of 16.8% from filed rates if this cost shift at the Mont hospitals were be, to be completely eliminated by 2020. So it's just quantifying the fact that the cost shift is embedded in that uh, commercial rate. So, um, so the cost shift is clearly a, a pressure on premiums, and I would then think to indirectly a pressure on your RBC, uh, your space capital ability to you know, earn a surplus if you're uh, having to deal with year and year a rising entire cost shift. Um, from Medicaid or Medicare, then that uh, reduces your flexibility to um, respond to some of the surplus issues that you're trying to address. Well, the, the change in the cost shift over year to year will be reflected in the trend analysis that um, the actuarial team puts together. So to the extent that, that shifts higher or lower in the form of uh, unit costs or utilization, um, that will so it is it's embedded in the results. And it's a big, it's a big number. It's accumulated. Right. Right. Thank you. I guess I'm not. I'm sure you're getting hungry. and am sure getting hungry and tired. So I've done my best to be concise. It's not just hunger. Just. It's not just hunger. Okay, well, I don't need to <laughs> hear anymore. <laughs> <laughs> So as the CFO, is it safe to assume that you're involved in strategy decisions for the company? Yes. Okay. So then I'm hoping you can help me understand some long-run strategy here. Uh, in Exhibit 1 on page 129, you and your memo reference the pricing advantage of the competitor in this particular market, which I asked uh, Mr. Schultz about. And as I expect, suspected, and Mr. Schultz confirmed, the competitor's pricing advantage has led to a declining market share of Blue Cross Blue Shield, has led to declining enrollments for Blue Cross Blue Shield, has led to increased risk for Blue Cross Blue Shield that's not been mitigated by the risk transfer um, amount. So that in turn has led to higher administrative costs per member per month and potentially higher claims costs that again are not mitigated by the risk transfer agreement which in turn has led to declining you know, solvency and the need for higher and higher premiums. So what I think I'm describing is somewhat of a death spiral, right? I mean, we're sort of getting into a model where the, the competitor's pricing advantage leads to these other uh, consequences that leads to a need for higher and higher premium growth to cover the higher administrative costs per, per member per month and the claims costs that are not being covered by the risk adjustment leads to higher deviations, leads to higher premiums, leads to greater competitive advantage. Where does this end? What can we expect going forward in terms of administrative costs going forward needs for CTR, for solvency, to cover these higher claims costs? Just can you help me understand where this goes? Well, I can uh, tell you it's a challenge. Um, the market share shift in a normal um, health insurance market, what will happen is if the um, rates go up and up, the, the members will go elsewhere. And then um, in an ideal world, the risk adjustment would level that out. So um, as Paul indicated in his testimony, 
mean, um, we are um, doubling our efforts, tripling our efforts on making sure that the risk coding uh, results are as optimal as possible. Um, the Vermont market is a little bit unique, so we have some special challenges there. Um, we also um, bank on um, just the continued good service and providing um, the services to the, the customers that we have on the list. The market share has declined a lot. It started out at 90%. I think many of us were thinking that there would be no world in the long term where we would continue to maintain 90%, but a market share of 60% or, or two thirds, as I think Paul testified earlier, is not a, a bad market share. So I think it's um, important for the Trust of Vermont to do what we're doing to make sure that we're looking at the uh, specialty drug um, opportunity. Reference to care management effectiveness. And I guess 
seen and done an abbreviated analysis of the cost of shields, uh, care management effectiveness. I'm sorry, could you tell me what page? Sure. Page 38 of Exhibit 17. Thanks. And it just referenced uh, Axine's abbreviated, so I understand, abbreviated analysis of the craft machine's care management effectiveness based upon only a few, but key utilization metrics. It looked at inpatient days per thousand, ER utilization per thousand, office visits per thousand, and scripts per thousand. And they referenced the usual to believe a more you know, extensive analysis they didn't hear, but based on that review, you see in the last little paragraph there, they noted opportunities for improved measures. So I'm wondering if there are you know, internal uh, assessments that you're doing about care management effectiveness, utilization review, that might, as a result of this study, that suggests that there are opportunities for reductions in wasteful expenditures. Do you benchmark against other blues? Is, there, is this going to be a potential way in which we can reduce waste? The answer to that is obviously yes. There's a number of um, programs, and I'll, I'll refer to Paul's testimony, even uh, the lab benefit manager is a good example of one where, um, as we benchmarked against the spend on labs, we could see that we were very um, high relative to what you might expect looking at other uh, industry measures. So we did set about looking at opportunities to I'll call it the waste out of the lab across part of the process. So the medical appointment needs some labs, but they don't always need a whole lab markup. And, um, so that's a good example of um, identifying a place where um, we had not previously been necessarily benchmarking the lab against something else. So in the AXE report, they could see that we were reporting and measuring and benchmarking a number of items relative to care management and utilization review, uh, but there are some other areas that we could um, do more measuring and comparing in the lab, and it's just an example of one of those. And uh, I expect that there'll be other areas that we could look at um, and improve. Of course, oftentimes it takes more administrative costs to go after that, and so to the extent that we'll be looking at the ROI on whether or not it costs us more money to go find savings or, or waste, um, we're constantly looking at the ROI on each of those ideas as it comes along. Great. And then my final question actually relates to something that uh, I think the Crossbow Ship was relatively excited about last year. It was a new web-based tool that was going to engage customers in some sort of incentive campaigns around the consumers. And there was no anticipation of savings in 19, but I think there was a hope again that this would be an additional investment and you'd see savings later on. And so that, along with the uh, price transparency tool for consumers, I'm wondering if either of those are translating into savings or changed consumer behavior that eliminates waste. You mentioned the um, the, way, the web based application. We remain excited about that. That has been rolled out, and that is a good example of something where we needed to find a more efficient way to.
have an impact, but it's relatively small in terms of engagement with people who are actually using it. Thank you. I'm going to interject here just to remind folks that we're behind where I thought we would be at this point. We're not through our second witness. We still have the commissioner uh, given the solvency discussion. I imagine that would go some time and they did them. So we could just all be cognizant of time and pointed in that question. That would be appreciated. Sure. I wasn't speaking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, I just want to touch on some of the changes that have occurred from RBC. And looking at your five historical, which was um, page 68, exhibit uh, 21, um, and the net underwriting loss of 15,492 in 2018, I just want to clarify something I thought you said that there was a charge. Was there to be, you said, another 7 billion on the um, risk transfer? Yes, that's correct. So um, the, the final risk adjustment payment for 2018 um, turned out to be $8 million dollars higher than what was recorded in these results. So, so that would be about seven. And then in your uh, under Exhibit 10, page 3, there was, there's discussion about the 7200 and the cost sharing reduction that um, you actually are trying to recoup. And two things there. One, I know when you built your estimates for for the for that year, they were assumed you'd get that. And then in 2018, which is the bulk of the 7.2 million loss, um, that impacted your 18 yes. results, right? So I mean, I know you had a big loss. I'm not saying that was 15 million, but when I look at it, you're going to get back about half of that due to the risk adjustment. And then the other half related somewhat to the CSR. This is true. Could you use that? Yes. Okay. And do we have any status on if you're going to get this CSR piece back? So the um, outline of the status was included, as you indicated, in Exhibit, in exhibit 10, um, question 3. And um, it's in the legal process. OK. Um, so I'm building kind of, if you're renting 2000, 2018, you have 495 RBC. And if those two things were adjusted, um, that's about a 60 RBC, which would bring it up to about 550. Um, but more importantly, if we look at um, on Exhibit 21, page 6, and the two big drivers on that page were referred to before, which were really the net deferred income tax and the change in the assets. I'm sorry, I just need to catch up with you. Page six of the annual decision. Yeah. Sorry. Right. That's all right. Okay, so in 17 and 18, and I kind of took them together to say, you know, that it was pretty extraordinary change. And so in 2017, uh, the net change was about 17 million, reducing your uh, surplus. Which line items are you referring to? Looking to the 29 million plus in net deferred income offset by the non admitted assets, okay. 6 million. Mm -hmm. So that was a change of about 17 million. And carried forward to 2018, it's another 7 million. And I understand we're going to get those back somewhat when we right. get the credits. But the reason I'm pointing that out is you know, we've talked a lot about what's happened over the last few years and what's gone on with RBC. And specifically, in the past four years, it went 663, 590, 558, and 495. And if I look in 2017 to the 558, and I add back the 80 for these two things here, because those were you know, fairly extraordinary for that specific year. Um, that's going to bring that up to another to about 640. And if I carry that forward to the to the next year, and we started at 495, and I add the 78 back, that brings us up to 583. And they add 31 million for this, 31 back for the 7 million change that we're going to have, in, that you took out in 2018. That brings us back to 614. Um, and then we just talked about another um, 
15 million 70, which would bring us up to 680. And the reason, but let's take, forget the 15 million for right now. That 614 is kind of apples to apples to what we've looked at the past couple of years. Because I'm just taking out those two things that you did before the tax, which we'll come back later. And I'm not trying to say I know you're at 495, and that doesn't change. Mm -hmm. But there's been a lot of talk about the reason that your RBC has gone down so significantly is because of all the actions of the Green Mountain Care Board and what we've done over the past few years. And that's certainly impacted, you've had losses. But when I look at those changes, you were at 663 in 2015, you went down to 590. This brings it back up to well over 600, which is you know now within the acceptable range. Yeah, she credits. Right. Yeah. And I know you know we are getting it back, and you added it back in later. But I just wanted to really kind of bring that point because that one change had nothing to do with anything that you know had to do with you guys going through and deciding these were not admitted. You had to change that. And, so I, it was in there, but I mean, the big change was in there. Of course, it was in there, but not the entire amount. But I mean, in 2017, you reduced your service yes. by 19 million, then we reduced it again by 7 million. So we had $26 million of reduction to surplus. Not even touching on, there was another $5 million reduction for changes in pension in 2018, as well as losses in 2018. But I just think it's good to kind of put in perspective yeah. that that change, which we will add back later, which gets you off the 495, um, you know, certainly puts us well within the range of where we needed to be, you know, even with the new guidance. And I agree, and this is a one-time change. So when those IMT credits come through, and goodness, they are coming through because we Sure, but you took them out as a one-time event in 2017 and in 2018, right. and they had been in there before. So if we took them out every year from your RBC, the net change in the RBC would be significantly less. I mean, we could go back and say, where, where were they in 2016 and 17? But in 17, you made a big change. You took them out, and they had been in your service. So the only, only 13 million had been in surplus prior. Or sorry, only 4 million had been in surplus prior. Right, so the net change is the 46 and the 29 in 17. I mean, is that something that's typical every year to have those big adjustments? That's true. It's not typical to have those big adjustments. That's all. I'm just, yeah, I'm agree. not disputing yeah. that, you know, there's we better to solve the same thing. numbers. I'm just trying to follow all the numbers to right. make sure I'm understanding the question. That I'm yeah, I think it was just there's been a change in methodology. Things change, brought your RBC way down, and, and things will adjust later. But that those would have been in prior years as well. Um, I'll have. The, I think mean, it's okay. I just want to. But those two lines, if we adjusted for those, would get us into about the 600 yeah, range. Yeah, which we're going to be talking about that. Um, and the only other question I have is just on the cost containment strategies and how, as CFO, you know, in your role, you know, how would you target specifically? Try to get more cost containment. What percentage? You know, how can we get a little bit more out of that year over year? And never ending process and it is a never ending process. We have a, a group of folks inside the company who look at the qualified health plan or the individual small group segment and look at the different components of, of costs in that uh, of business and they are constantly going through different find new opportunities and in fact the lab benefit management initiative is one of those that we found an opportunity that was both Containment opportunity at a, an admin investment that was reasonable to go after, so to speak. Thanks. So, um, earlier, much earlier than just for me, <laughs> um, you were asked by your attorney about um, the 
$110 million in reserves. And part of your response was that um, you said 550 per subscriber. And basically, I just want to uh, ask you if you think that's a little bit misleading given the fact that um, a large portion of your book of business is TPA or ASO. I don't believe it's misleading. I take your point that to the extent that the risk around the TPA and AFSO business is more credit risk and whether or not um, you know, you're paying that provider the money out than filling uh, it back to the client. So to the extent that it's a different kind of risk as opposed to the insurance risk, I feel that it's an appropriate reflection of um, how to put our total reserves into context do you remember what your percentage was for administrative costs in the last two years, not this year? You mean for not this year, meaning 2020? In, in the last two rate filing years, so 2018. Uh, off the top of my head, I don't know what they were. They were um, right around high six and something percent or seven percent. So my recollection is that they were in the sixes. So I'm just wondering if you would acknowledge that by this year being at seven percent, it's a trend in the wrong direction. With the loss of membership, we have had a higher um, total cost, and it has gone up to seven percent. But seven percent still compares very favorably against uh, industry averages of around ten to eleven percent. But it is a higher percentage than in the past. Yeah. Okay. said, so I'm just going to ask one final question. And it's only because I asked um, MVP yesterday the same question. I'd like to get your response. And that is that um, in your strategies trying to, do, to lower costs, um, one of the things that I hear feedback from providers, um, and I'll give you this example, they feel that um, by the way things are treated, that they sometimes have to suggest more expensive care for their patients. And the example I used yesterday is Colobar, which is about 90% effective. Um, probably a viable, low-cost alternative for those that don't have a family history. And yet, doctors are telling their patients, at least that's what they're telling me, that they should go straight for the colonoscopy because if the way Vermont law reads, uh, a screening like a colonoscopy or a mammography is treated one way. But what happens if the doctor goes with the colon guard, even though it's less expensive, to the system? That it could be much more expensive to the patient because if anything does come up, then the colonoscopy then would be treated as a diagnostic, and so it would have much higher costs out of pocket to the patient. So I'm wondering if you've had those discussions about trying to take away that incentive for the provider to uh, suggest the higher cost methodology. I can't personally speak to that. It would be our chief medical director that would be the best place to answer that. I, I would make a couple of notes and take it away and follow up on that question. Okay. Sorry. Can you redirect for this one? Just one question. Uh, Ms. Green, if you could turn to uh, page 128 of Exhibit 1. Can you repeat what page is? Yes, on page 128 of Exhibit 1. Good job. Again? Okay. Um, and does this page reflect that Blue Cross accounted for the AMT refunds in building the proposed rate that's, that we're discussing today? Yes. Okay. Nothing for that. Okay. Thank you. 
Ross on that very limited feature. <laughs> okay. well, I was hoping we could get uh, so Andrew Brown was your next speaker. That's right. Um, yeah, I think we got to go lunch. So I was take a 30 minute lunch break. Senior Vice President and Principal of Lewis Nellis, the Dallas office. I've been there for uh, 
a slightly over 20 years now. And what work does Lewis and Ellis perform? So Lewis and Ellis is primarily an actuarial consulting firm. Um, that's how we started uh, in 1968. But we do other um, areas of insurance work, also compliance, insurance compliance, and insurance uh, financial examination work also. You said that you've worked there for almost 20 years, or over 20 years. Can you tell us a little bit more about your educational background and your experiences? Sure. So I got a uh, math degree. Your educational background and experience. And experience as an actuary. <laughs> Sure, I got, a, uh, I got a bachelor's degree in mathematics from Oklahoma State University, and then a uh, master's in statistics and actuarial science from the University of Iowa. Um, I don't remember exactly when I got my credentials, but I've been a uh, credentialed actuary for uh, about probably 15, 16 years. And do you have any professional certifications? Yes, yeah, part of that credentialing, um, I'm a member of the American Academy of Actuaries. That's primarily kind of the professionalism and standards organization, and then I'm a fellow at the Society of Actuaries, and that's uh, primarily education and, and research um, body. And what is your experience with the Vermont Health Insurance Marketplace? So I've been involved in Vermont since 2014, um, when we were engaged by the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, we have worked with uh, approximately 65 islands across individual uh, small group merge market and uh, large group islands. And to what extent have you uh, done work in islands for other states? So the bulk of, of my personal work is um, kind of, I always joke I'm kind of a quasi-regulator. Uh, about three-fourths of my personal work is with states and jurisdictions uh, governing uh, health insurance. Uh, since 2010, uh, my staff has worked with over 20 uh, states and healthcare reform issues, uh, different aspects of it. Uh, currently, Lewis and Ellis uh, is advising 12 states on ACA break review, uh, the, and the four individuals that are primarily responsible for Vermont are working on nine states break review this year. And given that you've done some work with other states, what kind of comparative look do you get at the nationwide health insurance? Yeah, it's very helpful. Oh, what kind of comparative look do you get at the nationwide health insurance marketplace? So obviously, as everyone in here has commented and talked about, you know, Vermont is a little bit different. You know, the, the market is different. It's community rated. You know, it has a merged market. However, it is helpful uh, that we work with other states because obviously with the ACA, there's a lot of issues that impact everybody. It may impact Vermont a little bit differently, um, but it, you know, but it definitely does help. Uh, you know, to have discussions with other states and other people in terms of how uh, market light issues you know, impact them and how they might impact uh, in Vermont, such as the individual mandate, such as AHP, issues like that. And are there other ways in which you keep up with changing healthcare reform issues and changes in the regulatory landscape? Yeah, so in addition to primarily working with states, uh, Ms. Lee and I are both very active with the Society of Actuaries, um, and that keeps us very informed uh, with, health, with health insurance issues. Um, I currently serve on the Society of Actuaries Board of Directors. Ms. Lee is the Vice Chair of the Society of Actuaries Health Section. Uh, we both were involved with a recent strategic initiative for the Society of Actuaries called Commercial Healthcare What's Next. So it's kind of through those volunteer efforts, uh, we definitely stay on top of things uh, that we may or may not have also been addressed through work issues. And for those who are not aware, could you explain who Ms. Lee is? Uh, Jacqueline Lee, uh, my co-worker. And did she work on the side and also? Uh, yes, so the way I'll, I'll go ahead and maybe fast forward a little bit to one of your next questions is uh, in terms of how we do the review, uh, I mentioned earlier we, we primarily have a team of four actuaries that work in Vermont uh, and three are directly assigned uh, to the Blue Cross filing. Uh, Kevin Ruggerberg, um, who's an associate of the Society of Actuaries, was the primary reviewer. I was the, the ne kind of next in line or the, the primary peer reviewer for the Blue Cross filing. And then Jackie Lee is the secondary peer reviewer uh, for Blue Cross. And she was also, um, and, and we kind of, we both work on the MVP filings as well. So we kind of have different roles. She focused on the MVP, but kept an eye on Blue Cross to make sure we were consistent on certain issues and me with the MVP. So, you know, I also was a secondary peer reviewer on MVP. Uh, so that I can make sure that we were consistent with market-wide issues. And speaking to the filing process generally, um, what is the process and what sort of standards are you looking at? 
Yeah, so uh, in a rate filing, so you know, kind of mechanically, everything is done through SURF, the system for electronic rate forms filing, I think is what it stands for. Um, and that, so once the company uh, submits the filing through that, there is a 60 day window, a statutory window that we have to meet uh, to issue our report. Um, so as we review those, uh, as we kind of dig in and review the filing, uh, we will submit questions through SURF. Um, and the company will respond through SURF, and that's how we uh, communicate with the company uh, for several reasons. One, it's kind of a standardized process, and it provides a kind of a record after the fact, after the fact of all the communication. And what happens at the conclusion of your 60-day review? So we will issue a final report um, that we send to uh, Green Mountain Care Board, and it's posted publicly uh, for all for all parties. Uh, to review, and that includes any re recommendations uh, we may have. And I believe that report is Exhibit 14 for this filing. Could you turn okay. to Exhibit 14? Okay. And I'm specifically looking at page two, at the bottom of page two, where it says standard of review. Yes. Is this your standard of review, or is this the board's standard? So this is the board's standard of review. Uh, that is the primary review uh, that to. Um, so we assist the Green Mountain Care Board with several of these issues, um, primarily kind of the, the terms excessive and adequate and fairly discriminatory. Uh, but I will also note that in our review, there are um, you know, other requirements as well that we have to look at. There are some federal requirements, obviously, with the Affordable Care Act. Um, and then we also, um, it's been mentioned a couple times today, uh, that actuarial standards of practice help guide um, certain things that we have to review or how we review. Really and for those standards, how is excessiveness defined? So excessive, there are a couple definitions I think kind of CMS has to their own um, that, they, that they use when they review a filing, but kind of primarily for my review, it is based on actual standards of practice. And what we do is we review the claims piece, we review the admin piece, and we kind of make sure that all those issues are good. And then we compare it to the premium that's proposed and make sure that the premium, given the claims, given the admin, given those assumptions and, and a reasonable assumption for profit, that the premium charge for that is not excessive. And how about the definition for adequate? So it's basically the, the other side of that going. Once we've set that, uh, <coughs> kind of uh, reviewed the claims, reviewed the admin, reviewed the reasonable, um, I, I guess, kind of omitting the profit piece, we, we look to see if the premiums will cover those. And obviously, if the premiums do not cover the admin or the claims, then we would say it's inadequate. And how about defining the term unfairly discriminatory? Yeah, so unfairly discriminatory doesn't come into play too often in a review, um, especially kind of in Vermont. Um, but unfairly discriminatory is basically uh, just confirming that a carrier doesn't charge two very similar people different rates. Uh, you know, they may live in certain geographies or have certain ages, and it's just to make sure that they're charging similar people similar rates. And at various points during, during the report, you may state that given assumption is reasonable and appropriate. Could you explain a little bit about what that <clears throat> phrase means? Reasonable. Yeah, reasonable and appropriate is, is really just a synonym for not excessive, not inadequate. And to be clear, do you review a filing for affordability? Do not, no. And do you make any recommendations for this particular filing? Uh, yes, we did. I believe the, uh, let's see, the order on page. I believe it starts on page 24, exhibit 14. Um, while there are kind of a few multiple recommendations within each of these bullets. We do have um, seven bullets, seven kind of high-level recommendations. Uh, two of those do not um, impact rates as of the issue of this report. One may, which um, uh, would be uh, kind of what ultimately happens uh, with the unit costs in the hospitals. Uh, but as of the issue of this date, there, there were five uh, recommendations that impact our assessment of the rate, two which did not. So in the interest of time, rather than walking through each of these individual recommendations, I would like to turn to Exhibit 19 of okay. Exhibit 1. And have you seen this 
document and had a chance to review it? Uh, yes, I have. And were you present this morning when the control was testified regarding this document? Yes, I was. Okay. So, um, I was wondering if you could just go line by line and tell us what Ellie's recommendation is and whether that remains your recommendation after, after hearing testimony this morning. And do you want me to focus on each line or just the ones that they're showing up in disagreement or Let's start with the ones in disagreement. Okay, we'll do. Um, so the, the first one is the medical utilization trend. Um, when we reviewed, reviewed that, um, you know, there's several, you know, this is obviously a very key assumption. Um, it is kind of one of the true, real, kind of actuarial calculations and assessing, you know, um, what is appropriate uh, calculation for this. Uh, but there are some challenges this year. Uh, this is a very complex calculation, uh, primarily um, centering around the dramatic enrollment shifts that we've seen between the two carriers um, over the last couple of years. Um, obviously, if if no one moves and it's the same, you know, insurance company covers the same people every year, it's much easier to get a better understanding of what their costs are going to be next year. But it is challenging and complex to estimate what that increase is going to be when you're also uh, losing people and they're the people that are sicker and sicker and are sicker. You know, when did they become sicker? When did they decide? Uh, you know, did they have a decision? Was it a personal decision to stay with Blue Cross because they were sick? You know, so there's a lot of underlying variables there. Um, Blue Cross, um, in their analysis, definitely. Uh, did some controls to try to analyze, you know, an account. Uh, we might say normalized or standardized for those moving variables. Um, however, as we look through it, we, we wanted to ask further questions just to make sure that all variables were controlled because the market has changed so much over the last couple of years. Uh, and that did primarily center around kind of the health status of the company. Uh, the health status of the company has changed. Um, so we, we asked some questions about if the data uh, used for the trend had been normalized for health status, and um, they provided some preliminary information, which led us to further questions. Um, and it was still in our mind at that point that there might still be some additional factors um, that may not have been controlled for in the data, um, primarily, again, centering around um, big enrollment decreases and in increasing uh, health status. Um, so at that point, um, we uh, kind of combined the analysis uh, with MVP on a confidential basis. Uh, so this was information that both care we utilize this for both filings um, to help to help us assess both the, the trend of both filings. Um, but one reason we thought that was helpful was while MVP has growing enrollment shifts and, and is uh, relatively healthy and Blue Cross is been losing membership, in the aggregate, the, the Vermont market has been relatively stable. And so when you look at it in the aggregate, aggregate, it does kind of mitigate those enrollment shifts and the moving around because now we are a little bit more stable. There's still some, some issues going on in there, but it is still, again, kind of to the comment I made earlier, if something's more stable, it's easy to mitigate. Um, so that's why we looked at the market-wide data. Um, so when we looked at the market-wide data, it did help us um, get a little better sense of what the market was doing. Now, I will say that um, it is very clear that even after this analysis, Blue Cross's utilization is higher than the market average. Um, and, and we do think that that is supported. And, and uh, I believe it was mentioned that, you know, the piece was lower than that. Um, so obviously, you have one higher, one lower, you can average it out to, to where that market wide is. Uh, but after that um, aggregate analysis, we did feel um, that it kind of did help mitigate and control for some other factors. And so based on that, we recommended a drop of utilization uh, from, from their kind of final 3.2 to our kind of final 2.5. And after hearing the testimony this morning, have you changed your recommendation as to um, the recommendation to lower to no, I have not. Um, I, I, I completely understand Blue Cross's position uh, about the coding. Uh, that, that was a, um, a big topic of discussion this morning, and I completely agree that is an issue to be taken into consideration. 
Uh, however, it's our position that it did not control for all of the variables um, in the underlying data. Uh, we do believe that there can be some anti-selection even in a, in a closed cohort. Uh, when you look over multiple years uh, time period, there can be someone two years ago that is still around that at their last renewal could make some anti-selective uh, decisions. So we, we even we believe there are um, some other variables kind of lurking in the data, and that's why we believe using the market-wide data it does help inform that. Moving on to the next line, which is cost trend from 2019 to 2020. In LE's report, there was a recommendation about the board considering updated 2020 hospital budget information should it become available. Do you have any recommendations? As of today. So obviously I have not had any opportunity to uh, review their calculations for this estimate. However, based on our preliminary of the narratives for this information has not been released too long. Uh, but our preliminary information uh, is very consistent <laughs> with the Blue Cross's estimate. So while um, I reserve the right to maybe have a slightly different opinion once we get uh, an opportunity to review the data, uh, this does appear to be a, a reasonable estimate, estimate and in line with our expectations. So I'm going to move down a couple of lines to individual mandate and morbidity impact. Could you explain a little bit about your recommendations for the individual mandate morbidity impact and then maybe discuss whether that opinion has changed even the testimony this morning? Yeah, sure. So with the mandate, you know, this has been a very tricky assumption that we've reviewed and, and and, you know, this was, um, there's a lot of different industry information on it. Uh, but when we reviewed uh, Blue Cross's assumption, we felt that they were just slightly too conservative in their assumption. Um, and, there were, and that was different by a couple things. Uh, one was the assumption that if, if there was someone uh, that did not receive a subsidy and did not have claims that they would, they would leave, we believe that is slightly too conservative, and we have seen experiences where that is not in the case, not that case. Um, and data sets we have reviewed for other states and other analyses. Um, so we just felt it was just slightly too conservative. Um, and you know, we don't believe that since yes, there had been some kind of ebbs and flows with the you know, with if the mandate was in place or not in Vermont and uh, you know, kind of the different timelines. Uh, we did. We were not convinced that, that um, there would be that drop, uh, primarily again from the population that they assumed that they it would leave. So uh, we are recommending that removal of that assumption. And that remains for you after this month. Correct. Moving on to uh, changes to risk adjustment. Could you explain a little bit about? Yeah. That? So you know, risk adjustment. You know that. <laughs> yeah, so, so the risk adjustment is, um, I'll, I'll try to keep it somewhat short because we have had some discussion about it, but it is, it, this is a very significant factor and it's very important primarily because it is a zero sum game between the market players. It's a very challenging uh, assumption for the carriers to estimate because they, they pretty much are doing it with one hand behind their back because uh, they don't know what the other carriers uh, are doing and specifically in Vermont, but one other carrier. Um, so we um, started a couple years ago to kind of help facilitate that process. Um, you know, the filings have already come in, but we requested additional data, and we kind of get a better number for the estimate uh, that we deliver to both companies uh, that helped true up kind of a starting point for the risk adjustment calculation because we did have access to both carriers. Um, one additional step we did this year was there was a change to the federal risk adjustment program. They have continually tried to improve that process, and this year they made a relatively significant change uh, with some coefficients. Um, and so we took a look at that, and we did believe it would have an impact to the Vermont market. Um, roughly speaking, it impacted um, kind of the bronze platinum relationship, and that is an issue that was raised by Blue Cross last year, as we've been mentioning again in this filing. 
And so while I don't necessarily think the CMS change uh, was necessarily designed for that specific issue, it does kind of help mitigate that. Uh, and so once we ran those coefficient changes, uh, we informed both carriers uh, that their estimate should be modified, and that would be uh, more money received by Blue Cross. Uh, so those were kind of the two, the two main issues. Um, the area of, of uh, discrepancy or difference here uh, that Blue Cross mentioned today uh, was with regards to kind of the movement of the small of some small groups. Um, while I have not necessarily reviewed uh, all of those calculations, uh, I would advise the board that that would be something that would be reasonable to consider. Yeah, so the, the newborn morbidity adjustment uh, was somewhat similar to, to the previous comment. That was one where uh, kind of during the review process, for, for whatever reason, um, further questions were not asked and further commentary was not provided uh, for whatever reason. And uh, Blue Cross has mentioned today that that was not included. Um, so I, I would make the same recommendation uh, that this should be, um, would be reasonable for the board to review uh, their calculations. Thank you. And I know flipping back to, um, flipping back to exit, exhibit 14. Okay. I just wanted to confirm that there were a couple of recommendations on page, over on page 24 and 25. There was a recommendation to the city impact of selection. Um, I just wanted to confirm that this recommendation would have no impact on rates. Is that correct? Yes, the impact of selection goes to the issue I, I, I raised uh, earlier, discussed earlier about Blue Cross's concerns about kind of relationship between the middle tiers. They did some additional analysis this year and kind of modified their approach. We agreed with the modified approach. Um, however, we, we kind of felt um, it was maybe an above the line, below the line kind of issue. We just kind of made a recommendation where it should be included it, uh, to better represent what we believe that adjustment was for. Uh, but it is so, while you, if you look at a couple of the exhibits, you might see a couple of wide swings and two of the provisions, the net of those are zero for this issue. So having quickly reviewed all of those recommendations, uh, do you believe that the rates, if your recommendations are implemented, would be excessive? No. Do you believe those rates would be adequate? Yes. Do you believe those rates would be unfairly discriminatory? No. No further questions? I have a clarifying question. Um, changes to risk adjustment, newborn mobility adjustment, uh, will you be following up with objection letter to, in, or to across on those issues? I guess my question is to you is the, the typical part of all of those hearings on how we do that. I'm not sure. Okay. okay. I'll leave that open ended. Uh, questions for Mr. Dillon? Yes. Um, sorry, I can't see. I'll swing around here. Yeah. Um, I'm Mike D'Onofrio. I represent the Blue Cross. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I'm going to try to be very brief um, given the hour. I want to focus your attention on the medical utilization trend. Um, in particular, could you turn to page 11 of Exhibit 14? And in the middle of the page, do you see there are three bullet points? Yes. I believe you, um, Eleni, has identified as the reasons why you recommended lowering the utilization trend. Is that right? Yes. Okay. And the first bullet there, so the first reason says, Eleni notes that the outpatient utilization trend has oscillated in recent years and has leveled off in late 2018. So that's one of the reasons we gave for lowering the trend, right? Yes. Um, in um, doing whatever work you did uh, to come up with that reason, did you compare uh, the fourth quarter of 2018 to the third quarter of 2018 in terms of outpatient utilization trend? 
Uh, yes, we did. Uh, one thing that um, I did not mention earlier was um, 2018 definitely, there was definitely an uptick in utilization across all lines. Um, and, and so we did try to further review that and we did take that into consideration uh, between different quarters um, and between different benefit categories and how we assess uh, what the appropriate trends were by those categories. And, and as you just said, you, did, you saw an uptick in outpatient utilization as you performed that analysis. Yes. Um, moving to the second bullet, um, that one reads, the reduced assumption is consistent with market-wide data. You see that? Yes. And if you look over on page 10, the last sentence of the second paragraph reads, Eleni believes that a reasonable range for market-wide utilization trend is 1% to 4%. you see that? Yes. Um, so when you say that the reduced assumption is consistent, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, is that uh, range emerged from your uh, the market-wide analysis that you described in your direct testimony, right? Yes, the 1% to 4% is our range for the market-wide, yes. Okay, so when you say that the reduced assumption is consistent, with market-wide data, you mean that it falls inside that range? It, right. Yes, it seems reasonable based on that range. <laughs> yes. And the reduced assumption that you're talking about here is 2.5%, right? Because here you were looking at the trend after having taken account of cost containment activities, right? Correct. And the comparable Blue Cross trend, the, the comparable Blue Cross number to that 2.5% is 3.2%, right? Correct. And 3.2% lies between 1% and 4%, correct? It does. So, so that, so Blue Cross's proposed trend here is also consistent with market-wide data, right? Uh, yes, it also falls within the range. And, it's, and, and that is your definition for this purpose of what it means to be consistent with market-wide data, right? Uh, yes, the word consistent. I, I may not say it would be as reasonable, but consistent, yes. Okay, and the reason you gave here is that it was is that the reduced assumption is consistent with market-wide data. Correct. Okay. Um, okay, at the top of page 10, there's a, a small table. You see that? Yes. And that's the results of your market-wide um, analysis shown for three different time frames, right? Correct. So um, if you look at the first sentence under that table, um, you, Eleni stated that your 24-month market-wide estimate of 4.2% is substantially similar to Blue Cross's two-year estimate of 4.1%, right? Correct. And uh, just for the record, if you would flip to page six, um, there's a table towards the bottom of page six, and that's where you got the Blue Cross 4.1% from, correct? I believe so, yes. Um, flipping back to page 10, we, I may make you do that flip five times. Um, on page 10, uh, the next sentence under the, the table at the top, so the second sentence, states, that your 36-month market-wide estimate of 2.0% is materially lower than Blue Cross's comparable three-year estimate of 3.1%, right? Correct. And again, that 3.1%, the Blue Cross figure, comes from the table on page six, right? I believe so, yes. Okay. Now, the, the difference between, uh, go, go back to page six, I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you. Um, the difference between the two Blue Cross numbers here, the two-year average of 4.1% and the three-year average of 3.1% results from the inclusion of the time period 2015 to 2016 in the, in the calculation, right? Uh, I believe so. I'm just kind of reading that right off that table. Here. Okay, if you could return to um, page 10, please. Okay. Actually, I think, this, I think my next question is not tied to any particular page. Um, if, I just want to ask you a couple quick questions about risk adjustment. If risk adjustment results go up from year one to year two, that would indicate that 
the, the carrier's population in year two is higher risk than it was in year one, right? Okay. Um, and I'm sorry, by risk adjustment results, I mean the amount of a risk adjustment transfer. Yes. So is that a correct statement? Sure. Um, and would that be indicative of the durational anti-selection? That would be one measure of that, yes. Okay. But not the only measure. Sure. If, on the other hand, um, risk adjustment results defined as I defined a minute ago do not increase from year one to year two, um, that would mean that, that the, the relevant population is, is not higher risk in year two than it was in year one, right? Okay. And in that second scenario, would that be indicative of durational anti selection? Could you repeat the question, please? Sure. If, from, if, if a, for a particular population, the risk adjustment result, meaning the amount of the risk adjustment transfer, did not increase from year one to year two, would that be indicative of the presence of durational anti selection in that population? Not on the surface, no. One moment, I, I'm either done or very close to done. No further questions. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Tillman. Good afternoon. I'd like to ask you to join Mr. Schultz in my witnesses hall of fame. I have never been accused of being a club talker. So. I always joke at my office, they soundproof my office, so everyone else can have a quiet day. I don't have too many questions either. If you turn to page 11, I'm Okay. You're going over some of the sanitary as Mr. DiMaffio from a slightly different perspective. Um, you said that you're at the Third paragraph that Blue Cross's training assumption be reduced. You reduce your training assumption be reduced to two and a half percent a year, right? Correct. Okay. And MVP uh, used originally a zero percent utilization trend, right? Correct. And you all raised it and said that one percent was more reasonable. Correct. Okay. Why? Tell me why, if I am wrong, why I'm wrong. It seemed to me that Blue Cross, being a bigger company than MVP, would have more capacity to control the utilization trend, and therefore that at most its utilization trend should be what MVP is. What am I missing? So there, there are probably a couple different issues. Um, it is the data is very clear that uh, Blue Cross does have more utilization than, than MVP. Um, so even though we have adjusted for things such as health status, um, my, my, and this may be somewhat of a speculation, uh, but even after adjusting for uh, health status, it has something to do with the relationship Blue Cross um, has with its consumers and the providers. Um, we've definitely seen in other states where, you know, kind of the historical uh, comment is that the Blues are kind of the carrier of last resort. Um, when you've got something to have done, you go to a blues, and they do tend to have higher utilization, even accounting for health status. Okay, so, so you're, you're controlling for health status, controlling for morbidity. Even, even in that case, yes. It, it, it was probably, I would probably um, liken it to kind of an induced utilization factor in a way, um, where induced utilization while very similar to health status, even if someone is healthy and they have a richer benefit, they're going to use it. It's, it's somewhat similar to that argument. Okay, and as an actuary, we don't look into the reason. If you get into the judgment as to whether Blue Cross should be doing more to control utilization, you're simply looking Typically, no, you are correct. Okay. Uh, can we go to the middle of that page to see what the full uh, head Saying total allowed headache, saying total allowed yes. medical training. Um, and then uh, in the third line, you 
say that Emily believes in actual, an actual without a better trend, we want to fall in the range between three and a half and six and a half percent, right? Correct. Okay. And then go down uh, to the, the, the first bullet, you see, uh, the third, third paragraph on the bottom, using one of these recommended change reduces the overall trend from the 5.9 to 5.2. So that, yeah. so, so five point two is within the range of three point five to six point five, right? Correct. Okay. But it's a little closer to the high end of the range. Is there a range is there, right? It's a little closer to six point five than it is to three point five. Well one thing to consider here is that the total allowed is it's a combination of the utilization and the unit cost. Um, and, and you know the unit cost is not really changing here, it's the utilization. closer to the higher end than the lower end, correct? Uh, that might be the result, but that is not how we went about picking that number. Oh, I'm not, I'm not accusing you of uh, deliberately erring toward the higher end. I'm just saying objectively that number is closer to the high end than the lower end, isn't it? Yeah. Um, could you turn to the next page, page 12? Before the last paragraph, you see a couple of lines above that and talk about the observed increase in utilization of non-specialty drugs. Do you see that? Yes. I would take that into consideration, and I'd be more likely to consider a reasonable. 
I don't know if I would necessarily say that, but it would be more reasonable to consider. Fair enough. Um, how big does a company have to be in order to legitimately self-insure? That is a group, obviously a group of two. It's time to be able to self-insure, right? Correct. Okay, so, so based on your experience over the years, what have you come to believe is the likely minimum size? So I don't know if there's a bright line. Um, however, we do we don't typically see it um, historically much under 500 to 1,000 lines. It has gotten smaller um, with changes to to the market. I mean, there are a few exceptions to the rule. I'll, I'll speak to Lewis and Ellis. We were 60 employees and we self-insured, but we're also all actuaries and we like to think we know how to. Um, you know, um, use the self-insured, um, you know, utilize that process. But it, it's pretty, it, it's it's not very likely for relatively small firms, you know, closer, you know, in that 50 to 100 range. It, it's it's a big risk for, for Gary, or for, for the companies. For a firm that's not at all actuaries within 50 to 100, it would be a big risk. Yes. Um, you said that uh, l &E is doing work this year 12 states for uh, state regulators? Uh, yes, and my team is working in now. Okay, is that like in connection with exchange business? Uh, it is primary, I believe that nine is for the exchange business only, correct. Okay, and in all the states, I'm not going to ask you which state, all the states you're working on in, but in all the states you're working in, approximately how many carriers have filed for uh, rate changes in all those states? So we have a few states that have still not filed. Um, I believe we have, and actually I think while I was sitting in the back row, we received a few, so my answer may change from a few minutes ago, but I believe we've received filings in seven states so far. And how many carriers total in those states? So it's roughly, I'm trying to think, it's roughly, there is one, one state with one individual carrier, there's another state with two, and then everyone else is usually three to four. So approximately what, 20, 25 carriers? Yes. Okay. And of those 20 to 25 carriers, how many are seeking a rate increase as high as blue crosses increase? Well, I don't believe that that question is necessarily applicable because their populations are so different and they don't have community rate and they, uh, they don't have merged markets. Um, so their rate increase requests are dramatically different framework. Um, I don't, but even at that, I don't, I, I don't recall even the range of the rate increases in the other states. Do you know of any carrier in any of those states that is seeking a rate increase that is equal to or higher than the rate increase blue cross? I believe so, yes. Yeah. So you name that carrier in the state? Um, I'm very hesitant because I don't, some of that work is not public and I don't want to release a name if, if uh, it's not considered public. Uh, in the other states that you're working in, is the average rate increase, don't name any carriers, but is the average, is the average rate increase sought by the carriers higher than the average rate increase sought by the carriers in Vermont in any of those states? Uh, again, I, I think this question is, is somewhat not valid because those markets are so different because of the community rate and merged market, but I don't believe so. You know, I, I don't believe there is an average higher this year than that. Uh, are there any states in which l &E is advising health insurers this year? Um, I, uh, ACA, I do not believe so, no. Any state in which, is there any state in which Ellen is advising health insurers this year? Um, there are some states where I have, uh, or some carriers that I do advise, but not with affordable care act business. Okay, and what are those states? Um, I mean, most of the most of my clients file in multiple states, so I, I mean, I probably have to list them all. Okay, and, and how many clients? Um, I probably do work. I personally probably have, I can think of two insurance companies that I've had the most direct uh, contact with. And, and are there any other uh, actuaries who are advising insurance companies in other states? 
Um, yes. And how about the charters? That, that I cannot speak to. Uh, I cannot speak to how many insurance companies my business partners are consulting. Well, would it be more than five? Yes, probably. More than ten? Probably. More than twenty? I don't know. Okay. I have no other questions. Thank you, Mr. Dillon. Thank you. I just have one question. Yes. Uh, Dave, can you, can you turn to your report, page 15? Okay. Um, I, you were in the room earlier when Mr. Schultz testified that the overall enrollment in the individual market had increased in 2019. I'm sorry, did you repeat that? Yes. Did you hear Mr. Schultz's testimony earlier that the enrollment in the individual market had increased? Then just explain in the under changes in full morbidity, your second paragraph, the last sentence talks about a decrease in QHP enrollment across individual and small group markets in 2019 and how that relates. Yeah, so th this may not be the, the best worded sentence, but I think our intention here was regarding the kind of the non recognition of the uh, risk adjustment revenue. That was a reasonable <laughs> assumption. <laughs> Just one quick question. Um, yes. So as I look at these 16 factor categories on page, uh, page 26, um, there are, and I, I guess I'll ask the question this way. It's kind of an awkward question, but um, of these, um, which are the most salient in terms of the um, the purpose that the standard review, the, the components affordable, unjust, unfair, inequitable, misleading. Which one of these should we look to to give the best insight into those issues? And I ask that because this is the third place in my life where I've been involved in actuarial analysis. One was on the state employees' retirement system. Um, the other is for uh, state revenue estimates. Um, and there you had some kind of grounding in affordability. Um, you had issues like gross state product, unemployment rates, inflation rates, consumer price index, and personal income growth. And none of that is here. Um, so I guess, uh, in your mind, are there any of these that are most relevant to those issues I just listed? The short answer is probably no. Um, while I, I mean each of these are, each of these components broken out are all very uh, important to the overall rate, uh, I don't you know I, I don't really think any of them are uh, necessarily any more important because they are all interrelated, right? The morbidity impacts risk adjustment, which you know, impacts the uh, the trend and things like that. So I, I think the short answer is no. regarding the market-wide analysis that you did for utilization trend. Yes. And I just wanted to be clear, um, and that range was 1% to 4%. Correct. Right. And if Blue Cross had filed a 1% utilization trend, would you have found that to be reasonable? No. And is your recommendation still 2.5%? Yes. And one last question, just following up briefly from Ms. Rangoff. Uh, so to be clear, currently you are not advising any health insurers on um, an ACA-related health insurance filing. That is correct. Thank you. Questions on that? No more questions. Thank you. Any questions on, on that? You're right. Okay. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. I think we gained some time. Um, so the next on the list would be Commissioner of Financial Regulation. No. Um, so I think you missed the swearing in this morning. That's right. If you could uh, <laughs> stay standing and raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Okay, so whenever you're ready. Great. Well, thank you uh, very much. And 
Chair Mullen and the board for having the department here. I was reviewing the testimony from last year. Chair Mullen, and you said at that time that the Yankees were the second best team in baseball with five games out of first place. And we'll 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 <laughs> It's a great year. Yeah. <laughs> so I do want to thank uh, I do want to thank you for having uh, me here. I do first want to thank uh, the hardworking staff at the Department of Financial Regulation for their good work uh, in putting together uh, the uh, solvency opinion this year, uh, and for their general good work in regulating Vermont's uh, health insurance uh, and insurance marketplaces. Uh, as you probably know, the department uh, regulates a wide variety of financial uh, entities, uh, nearly 600 captive insurance companies, 16 traditional domestic insurance companies, 23 state chartered banks, credit unions, trust companies, approximately 1,000 non-depository licensees, and 50 investment advisor firms. Altogether, uh, these companies hold well in excess of $1 billion in total assets. Uh, and uh, we work very closely to ensure the monitors are well protected uh, and well served uh, by these firms and the individuals that work for them. So we do this for stringent licensing requirements, consumer outreach and education, financial and market conduct examinations, reviewing and approving products prior to their introduction into the Vermont marketplace. Uh, and we also do this by responding to complaints, uh, conducting investigations and enforcement actions as well. Uh, over the last five years, our Consumer Services Division handled approximately 18,000 inquiries, 2,200 complaints, uh, and combined with our market conduct actions, we returned 11.4 million to Vermonters in restitution and 1.3 million in penalties. And I say all of this just to um, highlight the point that our department is a consumer-focused uh, organization, uh, and I'm here to testify uh, in that vein. Uh, there's nothing more important uh, to consumer protection than the solvency of a company that we regulate. Uh, all, the, all the more true in this case, independent uh, and financially sustainable Blue Cross Blue Shield Vermont is good for consumers uh, because it certainly can pay its medical claims regardless of the economic conditions that it might confront uh, in the upcoming years. Uh, it can pay the medical claims regardless of unexpected medical events that might occur due to illness, outbreak, uh, other extreme conditions. Uh, and a financially uh, sustainable Blue Cross Blue Shield will also have the capital it needs to invest in programs and people and in technologies uh, that will improve the consumer experience uh, and more importantly improve uh, consumer outcomes as well. Uh, so the department is the primary regulator of Blue Cross Blue Shield. Uh, as the primary regulator, we engage in extensive oversight of the company. Uh, we do this through monitoring the company's quarterly and annual uh, financial results. Examining uh, certain metrics in those results, you know, including months of premium equivalency, uh, surplus as a percentage of revenues, uh, working capital ratios, the percentage of growth or decline uh, in the company surplus, uh, and we also continue to monitor uh, non-insurance risk factors, including credit risk, uh, investment risk, operational risk, uh, liquidity risk, uh, and reputational risk. Uh, the department also conducts periodic financial examinations. These exams are months-long processes. Uh, they involve being on-site. Uh, they are extensive. We review the books and records of the company. Uh, we interview senior management, the boards of directors, uh, and further examine any areas uh, that we have identified as heightened risk. Uh, the department also has regular uh, and ongoing conversations with the company regarding its financial conditions, uh, its operations, and any recent developments. Another important regulatory tool that I think we've talked about a lot today is risk-based capital, uh, or RBC. Uh, I think the board knows that risk-based capital has two main components, the financial calculation itself, uh, and then also the model law, which we've implemented here in Vermont, uh, and every other state across the country has implemented regarding when an insurance commissioner or department uh, can take specific action uh, based on the level of impairment on RBC. I think we talked a lot about uh, what goes into the RBC uh, factor, so I will skip that, but if you have any uh, questions about that, happy to take them. So uh, as to our solvency opinion, we've talked in the past about how there's been some increased urgency as it relates to our solvency opinion. Uh, that urgency is uh, repeated uh, and uh, also um, uh, continues to this day. Uh, and the reasons for that uh, are really fourfold. Uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield risk-based capital ratio uh, today remains at its lowest point uh, since the establishment of the Green Mountain Care Board. Uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield's ratio is the lowest among its comparative companies across the country. Uh, in fact, its current RBC ratio is approximately half of the average RBC ratio for comparative companies uh, across the country. Uh, Blue Cross is the only comparative company whose RBC ratio has trended downward for each of the last four years, uh, falling in a total of 171 points, uh, or 26% of its total RBC score. Uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield has also fallen out of the company's recently approved targeted RBC range, uh, and where they stand today would also be outside of the previously approved uh, range as well. 
So one of the shortcomings of RBC is the fact that it's a historical looking uh, formula. Uh, it does not look to the future. It does not look to things uh, that might be company specific as well. Uh, so there are some additional factors I want to mention as it relates to our solvency uh, concerns or solvency impact, I should say. Uh, first, Blue Cross Blue Shield being a single state loose plan. Uh, this limits the company's ability to spread risks over a broad base uh, geographically, uh, thus making it more vulnerable to global risks such as uh, epidemics, uh, severe weather, calamities and other uh, similar events. Uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield being a non-for-profit uh, also limits the company's source for obtaining capital, uh, basically to that of generating gains through operations or great increases. And then further, uh, there continues to be unpredictability surrounding federal health care policy uh, and its corresponding impact on the Vermont health insurance marketplace. Uh, so it continues to be a very unstable uh, federal landscape for sure. So all of these factors uh, add to our solvency opinion. These are outside of the RBC uh, calculation, but the RBC status itself uh, does also give us a pause for concern. I think we also talked about uh, AMS uh, credit rating agency. Uh, I think folks know them. They, they are a, uh, a credit rating agency that focuses on the insurance industry. Uh, they rate many of the companies that we regulate, many of the captive insurance companies that we regulate as well. Um, as a board uh, knows, they uh, revised their outlook for Blue Cross Blue Shield's long-term issuer credit rating from stable to negative. Uh, they talked about uh, the fact that uh, uh, they've had uh, sharp uh, underwriting losses uh, and that there has been pressure uh, on uh, the company's um, uh, performance the last four years. And some of that, I think they use the word primarily, some of that uh, is uh, attributable to the um, rate process and not receiving adequate rates uh, over the past four years. So that's something else uh, certainly that we take into account uh, is the uh, independent rating agencies that might rate our companies as well. And that certainly gives us a pause for concern. Uh, further, the department also conceptualized risks in different ways. Uh, on page four of our solvency opinion, you'll see a table that we created in last year's opinion. Uh, we updated it for this year as well. Uh, this illustrates Blue Cross Blue Shield's net premiums earned. Uh, so these are the premiums, not uh, the, um, the businesses that self-insure, but the premiums that are earned. Uh, that has grown 10% since 2014. Uh, while their surplus has declined uh, over 20% during that same period, while their membership has remained uh, relatively flat. All that means that Blue Cross Blue Shield's risk exposure has increased uh, while uh, over the last five years its corresponding surplus safety net has significantly decreased. So there's more risk uh, and less safety net, putting the company at further risk. Other companies that we regulate uh, that we've looked at for the last five years uh, have seen similar premium revenue increases, so approximately 36%. Uh, but during that same time period, their surplus has kept up uh, by increasing by approximately 38%. So Blue Cross stands alone uh, as we look at some of the comparative companies that we regulate uh, as well. So I think the board again also knows that the new RBC range order uh, that we um, uh, filed earlier this year requires Blue Cross Blue Shield to promptly uh, file with the department plan to move back within its range if they ever do fall out of it. Um, as I mentioned, at the end of 2018, Blue Cross RBC sat at uh, 495, uh, considerably outside of its actuarially re uh, reviewed and approved range. Uh, they have submitted a plan to the department uh, that calls for uh, 17.9 million 2019 AMT refunds to go towards surplus, uh, which will boost its uh, RBC by approximately 78 points. Uh, similarly, in 2020, the ATM refund of uh, 8.7 million will go toward uh, surplus, increasing it by an additional uh, 26 percentage points. This plan that Blue Cross has submitted to the department would revise the four-year downward trend in RBC, uh, would move the company into its approved target RBC range, uh, and would move it closer to its comparative companies across the country. Uh, I view this and the department views this as a unique opportunity to get Blue Cross Blue Shield trending in the right direction uh, and safely back within uh, its range without dramatically or really increasing at all its contributions to reserves that are normally filed. Uh, I would note that uh, it's estimated that a 7% contribution to reserve would be necessary uh, to reflect the same impact that these uh, alternative minimum tax credits would have. So I really do um, mention this as a unique opportunity. Uh, all the things that we've said are true in terms of the trending uh, and some of the other uh, solvency analyses that we do that give us some pause for concern. Uh, but there is a unique opportunity to really uh, shift the company uh, in a positive trajectory uh, uh, from an RBC perspective, from a solvency perspective, from a surplus perspective. Uh, and I do urge the board to take advantage of that. Uh, 
Uh, so in conclusion, the department does not expect the proposed rate uh, will have a significant impact on our overall solvency assessment. However, the department does caution the board that any downward adjustments to the filings rate components that are not actuarially supported uh, would continue to reduce Blue Cross's surplus and continue to negatively impact its solvency. Uh, considering the circumstances described above, uh, and our, uh, it's our opinion in our solvency letter uh, that any departure from the rate filing should be made in, uh, with great caution. So with that, I'm happy to take uh, any questions. Thank you. Questions for the commissioner? No questions. Questions for the commissioner? Yes, good afternoon, commissioner. You were nice enough to come over here and talk about your solvency opinion. Uh, I've got a couple of questions about your solvency opinion. I'd like to ask you about some other things, too, if you're prepared. If you're not, that's, I, I won't, because it's We're always prepared. Specifically, are, are, are you, would you mind answering a couple of questions about your permitted practice order that uh, you put out on February 23rd, 2018? Sure. Okay, okay so do you, is, it, is it in front of, does the witness have? Uh, yep, I think the binders are to your left, right there. That would be exhibit 23. Binder 2. And binder 2. Small so it's a little box. Just to confuse everything. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any budget tabs. I have my own copy. Well, if you brought the, you happen to bring that with you. Yes. Great. Um, okay, so so in that order, you uh, get Blue Cross to not admit the entire AMT refund amount that is getting under the Trump tax bill, correct? That's correct. Okay. And in paragraph three of this order, you know the income tax recoverables, like those AMT refunds, are generally considered admitted assets under SAP number 101, right? Uh, yeah, those are expected to be recovered within the next calendar year. I'm sorry? Uh, those that are expected to be recovered within the next calendar year. Correct. Okay. And so we're now in 2019. And so the amount of those refunds that would be expected to be recovered in the next calendar year are, aren't they, the 19.9 million for this year, and then the additional amounts for next year. Yeah, I think it's 17. Uh, but the, but uh, the point I think that you're making is, uh, are these amounts uh, showing up on their financials? Uh, and I think the broader point, or the, just to cut to the chase, is that they have submitted a plan, they being Blue Cross Blue Shield, uh, to the department uh, that shows uh, that they anticipate using uh, the alternative minimum tax or refunds uh, to fund, uh, to go to their surplus once received. Uh, that's part of their plan to get back within their range. Uh, I think they've been um, transparent also in their financial statements. The first footnote to their financial statements mentions this permitted practice and the fact that it has been issued by the department. Um, so, uh, you know, at this point, uh, you know, I think that's all been very done in a straightforward, uh, transparent way. And I think the board and ourselves and, and others uh, are, understand the position of Blue Cross Blue Shield and what they intend to do with those alternative minimum tax uh, refunds. Um, Is it true that under the own standard, the standard which you, which you set out in paragraph three there, that these tax recoverables, tip, recoverables typically relate to amounts expected to be recovered in the next calendar year, that you shouldn't, that based on that standard, there is no basis to not admit the amount this year, this calendar year, for the following year. What, 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 is, what is the standard? What is, whether, whether it's under a slot number one or one or anything else, what standard authorizes the non-admission of a tax recoverable, which is payable, and in this case, Blue Cross knows it's payable and has announced it's payable in a couple of months, and clearly next year, it will also be, I mean, as a practical matter, there is nothing that's going to happen to prevent the payment of this money either this year or next year. And given that, shouldn't this be an admitted asset that is now part of the surplus? 
So uh, to answer your question, first, this is a five-year payout period, so it's going to be five payments under this uh, under this uh, payment uh, refund. Uh, so that's uh, why we issued the permitted practices. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. So so it is a five-year uh, yeah. refund uh, schedule. So there's going to be five years in which uh, there's going to be taxes owed uh, to Blue Cross Blue Shield. Uh, we hope that those payments continue to come, that there are no changes in federal policy that impact them. Uh, but certainly, even with the 2019 uh, payment, uh, it's uncertain when those are going to be collected, whether it's going to be calendar year 19, whether it's going to be in early 2020. Uh, so uh, certainly with the 2020 payment, uh, that might not be received until well over a year from now. Now, uh, if not longer than that. Uh, so the way that we approached this was to say that they would be admitted assets once they received the refunds, uh, once they could go to the bank and take the refunds and pay claims and pay uh, operational expenses for Blue Cross Blue Shield. That, that's what we're saying under the new practice order. Okay. But for that order, you agree that they would, they would all be admitted now, correct? I think that's correct, at least the payments in the current years. Okay, and Blue Cross itself and I recognize that you put out this order last year, in February of last year, but Blue Cross itself is now saying that, yeah, we're getting the money in October of this year. Would you, uh, assuming that your order was reasonable when uh, issued, would you agree that now that Blue Cross knows it's getting the money in October of this year, that at least the first 19.9 million should not be not admitted? So, you know, I think, again, I'll go back to the, the statement I made that they've been very transparent with us about what they plan to do with those monies. So we anticipate them going into surplus. Whether they're admitted or non-admitted at this point, I think is somewhat beside the point. Uh, we're confident that that $17.9 million is going to go uh, to surplus. That's the plan they filed with our department. Uh, whether they're admitted or not, uh, you know, is, uh, is not too much of a concern for us. Well, it, it, it is not beside the point, though, is it? Yeah. The absence of that $19.9 million makes a difference between an RBC ratio of 575 or so and 495. I think that's uh, correct, and that's why in my testimony I said what the anticipated uh, RBC impact would be uh, to those monies flowing uh, to the surplus. Uh, so that, I think, is important for the board to know that that's going to be the impact. I think Blue Cross included it in their filings as well. Uh, so again, just you know, to reiterate, that's going to be a, a significant uh, impact of somewhere around 78% uh, for this year and about 36% for next year. Uh, so that is well known to those that are making the decisions. In connection with your solvency opinion, you considered various factors, various risk factors. Did you also consider factors that mitigate risk? For example, did you consider the fact, did, did you consider the fact that Blue Cross's uh, reserving practices, according to both their consultant Axie and your own author, Lyman, were ultra conservative. Well, I don't think they use the word ultra conservative. I think they use the word conservative. And I talked to our actuary about that uh, particular point. He said even though it was uh, conservative, it was still reasonable. Uh, so that I remember having a conversation with him before the order was issued. Uh, so that uh, simply, uh, the fact that they were conservative on that point simply meant I'm sorry, the fact that they, were they were conservative on that point simply meant that there wasn't going to be an adjustment uh, in their study uh, that made that an additional uh, risk factor. Could you turn to the Exhibit 17, please? Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Commissioner. I have no further questions. Thank you. Thank you. Questions from the board? I think I'm going to pass for now. I may have a follow up, but I'm going to let other people have more time. I just have a few more. As a consumer focused agency, as you were, um, I'm sure you recognize the tension, particularly the board phase, the tension that exists between the need for consumer protection achieved through solvency with um, the sort of concerns associated with the affordability of rising premiums. That is effectively the tension that we face. And your consumer focus agency focuses largely on solvency. Um, and as we've heard testimony today, as these uh, blue cross issue premiums rise relative to competitors, we've heard testimony <coughs> that enrollments will fall average health risk rises. And as a result of that, Blue Cross Blue Shield will face even higher uh, administrative costs per capita for enrollments. And the fact that their average health risk goes up means that their adverse claims experience is going to grow. It's not going to be mitigated by the risk of transfer. Um, because it's not fully one-to-one -one on that. That, of course, is going to affect solvency. Going forward, the solution to that is ever-rising premiums to cover the higher administration costs and the higher risk and presumably higher CPRs to cover this. So my question to you is, there's going to be a cycle here that I'm concerned about. Um, how does the current competitive position of Blue Cross Blue Shield in this community market affect your assessment of Blue Cross Blue Shield's ability to reach the target range of the RBC that's set forth in your order? Um, you know, what are the CTRs that are going to be expected? What are the premium growth rates that are going to be expected to achieve that target range given the competitive position of the Blue Cross Blue Shield? Yeah, so um, it has that one, the, point, the one point I'll make uh, first is that, you know, as, as members uh, leave of a company, in this case Blue Cross Blue Shield, uh, all else being equal, you're likely to see their RBC score uh, go up. Uh, because there's uh, the same amount of reserving, or same amount of surplus, I should say, uh, but there's less lives to be covered. Uh, so you can actually see their uh, RPC go up, but certainly then there becomes a question at some point about scaling, like how big does a company need to be to achieve uh, the scaling that's necessary to ensure that its administrative costs aren't too um, high as a percentage of a premium and, and that they're getting uh, the right types of uh, agreements and contracts in place, uh, to your point. Um, so in terms of uh, contributions to reserves, I mean, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield for a long time has had a, a 2% contribution to reserve revised down to 1.5% after uh, the federal tax uh, went away. Um, and that uh, is um, something that we find to be reasonable at the department and, and agree with, that uh, if that 1.5% is funded year in and year out, there'll be some times where that might not be needed fully. There might be some times where a much higher contribution to reserve might be needed. Uh, but if that is consistently um, provided for, uh, uh, then the surplus should be uh, in a range that you know is sound. Um, in this particular instance, the contribution to reserves wouldn't help it catch up to the degree that it needs to, because you would need something like a seven percent uh, contribution to reserve to get it closer to uh, that new uh, RBC range, but for the alternative minimum tax refunds. So again, that's a unique opportunity to get it within its range. Um, and if the care board does uh, fund uh, that contribution to reserve and. Uh, you know, of course, we fund contribution to reserve, but there's other areas that are cut that are not actually other supported. You know, it's the same as cutting uh, to that component. So there's something to be mindful of all the way around in the rate filing. Uh, but uh, if they're getting that to their uh, to their baseline, then they should be in a, a sound financial position, regardless of um, potential uh, you know competitive environment. So let me just follow quickly. You mentioned that the RBC is, is will be needs will be lower if they have good members. So does that mean that if the enrollments continue to decline, there should be a new target range? Yeah, so I mean, one, like we talked about, I think in the previous meeting, uh, there's certain factors that impact the company that the range needs to be examined, uh, and that's something uh, worth looking at. Now, I think you might find also that uh, some of the higher risk, potentially, uh, kind of individuals and uh, groups might be staying uh, with the Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, company, so uh, that might, Against well, that's what I meant by the, I think yeah. the folks that are staying at higher risk, so in, in effect, I'm worried that they may need to be getting higher reserve, which is going to require higher premiums, which is going to fuel that cycle. So I'm just trying to figure out where this ends. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, I think that, and unfortunately, I don't think the answer is in the rate process. I think the answer is a little bit we're not careful what it's doing outside of that and, and that of Blue Cross and, and other Vermont stakeholders have been part of it as well. I think that's probably where the answer lies, not so much in the, in the rate filing process. Um, but certainly,
you know, to the all-payer model. Yeah, exactly right. But, but certainly, those efforts will be stymied if Blue Cross Blue Shield, uh, even in the short term, doesn't have the capital uh, that it needs to you know, have sufficient reserves, make investments in technology and processes and people uh, to help uh, in those, you know, help with those innovations. Thank you. Um, I just want to go through some of the RBC calculations yeah. and some of the discussions. Um, agree that they're at 495 right now. Um, but looking at what the biggest impact has been over the past five years, um, could you venture to guess what that is? So if you look on our, at our solvency opinion, um, we had our outside actuary all alignment care <coughs> financial analysis. Uh, and on page um, three of their report, uh, you see the last five years, and certainly the thing that catches my eye is underwriting losses and gains uh, for the last three years. Um, uh, certainly not all of those years that they have lost because other things uh, in terms of investments and whatnot may have picked up the, the slack, but uh, that's certainly something that catches my eye. Yeah. Uh when I look through it, I actually see a little different. I see it a little differently. Over the past five years, the underlying loss has been 20 million loss, and the net the uh, net investment gain has been plus 35. So there's actually been about a 15 million contribution for those two categories. <coughs> the biggest change that I see that's gone on is. Prior to a couple of years ago, they had these admitted assets in their surplus. So the past two years, they've taken those out. And that was based on the chart, if you look on um, Exhibit 21, <coughs> page 6 in Book 1. So what I did is, if I, took a, if I did a bridge, like this one was bridges for two years. So if I did a bridge from the 590 that we were in 2016 to the 495. Get to the exhibit, which, oh, sure. which so it's exhibit, uh, exhibit 21, page 6. Oh, binder. Is it there? Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Is there binder? So what page It's in the second book, exhibit 21, page 6. And we could go back and do it in a basic time. But if we look at these, you know, these two years, the net income has been about a wash. The change in unrealized gain about a wash. The change in net deferred income tax and the change in non admitted assets has been a $24 million change. $17 million in 2017, $7 million in 2018. That combines for 110 um, RBC points. So that's really what's driven the biggest change. It used to be in their numbers. Now, as you say, we have this unique opportunity that it's going to come back. But it was there. Now it's going to come back, which is great. But I, I think the point we're missing is that um, over the past five years, Barring that, there hasn't been a lot of change. The other negative is if you go down, or, you know, their gains are lost in surplus, <coughs> due to their pension being down. So I just want to make sure we're yeah. realizing that you know there's been a lot of focus that what the Green Mountain Care Board has done has detrimentally impacted their RBC and what put them into a plus five. And respectfully, I don't agree with that. I would say those assets used to be in their numbers. They're now out of their numbers. They're going to come back in their numbers. So I just want to clarify. If I can just clarify one thing. So in 2017, with the tax cut bill that uh, passed in like December of 17, I think, uh, and Blue Cross Blue Shield paid in a federal uh, alternative minimum tax uh, for corporations, not for individuals. That was a deal that was struck. Uh, in the 80s, and Blue Cross certainly can tell you more about that. Uh, but those were payments that were never expected to come back to Blue Cross because they're a nonprofit. Uh, it just so happened that because that uh, alternative minimum tax for corporations went away, that they got these tax credits. So they wouldn't have been on their financials prior to 2007, 17 rather, because they never would have been owed, they never would have anticipated getting those, de those deferred tax payments back uh, due to their nonprofit status. Uh, because the, the alternative minimum tax went away, that's what created the, all, the admitted assets to come onto the balance sheet, which would have been in 2018. 
uh, but for our February 2018 order that said, you know, when they filed with us in March of that year, that they could treat them as not in the assets. And again, the reason we did that was not to deflate or to mess with our RBC score, but simply we, looked, we thought it would be misrepresenting if they did it the other way because they didn't have that money, you know, in the bank. They didn't have that money to go get and pay claims with. Um, so we thought it was a more appropriate representation to hold those assets back. Uh, so just for to treat them as not admitted, I should say. And I'm okay with that. I'm just saying if I look at what's happened, if you look at this, what changed in RBC over the past two years, the biggest driver was the, those two lines. And the actual operations were about break even, and the operations over five years actually were favorable. So we, you know, we are where we are at 495, we're going to get back up. Yeah. But I, I just really want to be on the record that barring some of that in and out, the, that's what's created a lot of the noise in the RBC. And we would have been quite a bit higher had those been in there. On top of that, there are small adjustments like the $7 million that you know, they're supposed to get back from risk. That's 30, you know, so that brings them from 495 up to, you know, up again by 30. The, um, CSR adjustment that they can get back. So I just wanted to you know, kind of really point that out because a lot of the documentation really points just to what the Green Mountain Care Board has done as far as rates. And when I look at net operating income loss, because you do expect to have some gains on your portfolio. Yeah, sure. And reserve, <laughs> that should offset and help you in your RBC. Those have been washed for the past five years. Um, so just wanted to get that point out there. Um, and just another topic on ACO risk. And you know, right now the ACO in Vermont is holding about estimating the potential overall risk of $30 million. Very small amount for commercial, about $3 million. Most of it's in Medicare. But the hospitals are now taking on that risk. And that shift over time should we be 100% in you know, there's this very small move in the RBC range for Blue Cross relative to that. I just want to get your perspective on, you know, where the risks should reside, you know, when we have, you know, if we had a fully populated ACO, and if, in fact, you know, 3% or of, of a risk of up to 6%, 50% was going to be borne by the ACO on commercial, how would that impact? Yes, I mean, the risk doesn't, doesn't disappear, right? I mean, it gets uh, shifted to some degree. So certainly, I think my perspective would be you'd want to think about what are ways to measure the risk that might be residing in new places that you haven't, that we haven't you know, thought about or, or sort of measured in, in ways uh, in the past um, and coming up with something that I think was universally agreed to as a, as a solid uh, indication of, um, you know, uh, uh, I would say solvency, or solvency, or ability to pay, or ability to manage that risk. Uh, you know, coming up with a new way of measuring that is probably uh, going to be critical uh, as this uh, continues to go forward. Okay. And just one last thing, um, you talked about not adjusting rates if they're not actually supported. Mm -hmm. And would you support that what LME has put forward is actually supported? Yeah. So we, uh, you know, did a, a, a somewhat. Um, you know, un unusual in the sense that we don't ask our actuary to get involved in the rate process uh, in a general term because uh, of the rate that was requested being high and uh, higher, uh, as high as I've ever been a commissioner and, uh, and also the RBC being at, at the lowest point uh, since I've been commissioner. We did ask our actuary to both look at the financial status uh, on top of our analysis and also to take a look at the rates um, as it relates to the two major points of disagreement I think uh, our actuary uh, said on the individual mandate that they had seen uh, more conservative, I guess you would call it, uh, filings that uh, that uh, included a number that was even greater than Blue Cross Blue Shields. Uh, so she uh, and all the linemen, it was not an actual opinion, I don't want to say that she gave me an actual opinion, but this was her uh, thoughts on the filing, uh, that she agreed with uh, um, Blue Cross Blue Shields' perspective uh, as it relates to the trend. Uh, they uh, said that there was uh, some room of reasonableness there on both sides. Uh, so they saw that as a range instead of one being more right or one being less right. Uh, so I will just caution or just mention that when you do have a range to consider uh, whether you want to take the low end of the range every time uh, considering the financial status of the company. Uh, there might very well be times where you want to do that to, to, to balance affordability. Uh, but uh, there's also probably times where you want to be cautious of that because of where a company might reside in their overall financial status. Thank you. Yeah. 
the questions. Robin, you have one? I do. Um, so the opinion that you just gave is not your actuary's opinion, is that what you said? That's correct. Okay, thank you. And in terms of um, risks and re reserves, would you agree with the statement that reserves should, should reside appropriate to the risk taken on by whichever party? Uh, I believe that's correct, yes. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Mark. Thank you for your testimony. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Fisher. I think we have, so we're, we're one minute away from four. Do we have a little bit of? We have a little bit of a wiggle room, so I'll allow it. Oh, yeah. <laughs>
Um, and uh, I know, you know, really important things have happened in the last couple of months around Springfield. Um, appropriate things, injections of cash, a lot of meetings, and probably a lot more than I know about have happened. Um, and those are the right things to do to save a community hospital that's in trouble. Um, I just want to say that we have a very similar crisis that's happening in a much more private way. Um, Vermonters are proud. People are proud. They don't want to speak out loud about what's going on for their financial crisis. They don't want to talk about it. Um, but it's impacting the ability of people to get the care they need. And, um, and thank you, board, for taking on this task of balancing these two really, really big pressures. Thank you. Questions? No questions. Questions to the board? Um, okay, thank you. See you down the road? Yeah. Uh, so, I would propose we skip closings, but um, is, that, is that reasonable or would you like to make a closing statement? Yeah, okay. well, we have that. okay. We have until 415. What's that? We have until 4.15. But they should be allowed to make a close. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How about a two minutes? Is that for three thousand? Two minutes. Okay. Okay. Um, so I'll just go back quickly to the beginning of this hearing. Right? The healthcare act that suggested that a fee would be overreaching. And I want to respond to that directly. And just say that based on the evidence that we've heard, there's no, there is no overreaching in this request. Uh, Blue Cross has no incentive to overreach. As we've heard, they're a nonprofit with a mission to serve our honors, and they have every competitive incentive in the marketplace to make their rates as low as possible. Um, and the testimony that we've heard about their administrative costs, about the essential need for a CTR contribution, and given their solvency and the actuarial building of the rates makes it very clear there is no padding in this rate request. Um, there's some disagreement among the actuaries, but I think um, I'll make this point brief. Uh, as the commissioner uh, indicated on the trend piece, it's a range. There's a reasonable, um, Blue Cross's proposal is reasonable, it's within the range. And given the solvency concerns and the circumstances here, given the evidence about the uptick in utilization, uh, this is a very risky time to go to the low end of the range. Um, there's there are two overarching points that I think we want to close the hearing on. One is, as, we, as has come through the witnesses, the premiums have to be funded to pay for the cost of health care. There's no padding in the rates. A cut to those does not make health care cost less. It does not make health care more affordable. It just underfunds the premium. It puts the solvency of the insurer at risk and puts strain on the system. Underfunding the rates is not the way to reduce the cost of health care. Um, as we heard from Mr. Garland, fully funding the rates supports the ACO, which is the payment reform um, effort that's going to show results down the road. And the other overarching point is, is that solvency is a critical issue. It's the most important element of consumer protection. And if the rates are underfunded, it's going to put further strain on Blue Cross's reserves, and it's going to threaten your solvency, which will ultimately threaten those factors that the board must consider, access to care, access to quality care, and ultimately affordability. Probably pretty close to two minutes, I'll try to do the same. We'll follow our approval and we'll go through all the actual issues, but the big issue, obviously, to me, and I think to the most, to many people anyway, is the whole issue of the tax refunds. Blue Cross, understandably, wants to use that money to build up its surplus. Surplus in Vermont of the Blue Cross plan has traditionally been among the lowest in the country. It always has. And they see, and I see from their perspective, a unique opportunity to take this step, this windfall, and to build up their surplus. From the commissioner's perspective, I also see, from the commissioner's 
soccer also see his perspective. The worst, uh, I was commissioner in Missouri for six years. The worst thing that could happen to a commissioner is to have a company go bankrupt, go insolvent under your watch. If people have to pay rates, pay high rates, get a lot of complaints, but it's not catastrophic. If a company goes insolvent, it, it's a commissioner personally is the one who feels it. So I get, so I get from his perspective. Although I don't think there's a realistic chance of that happening in, in Vermont, for obviously the reasons discussed here. Um, I do think, though, that, as I said originally, Blue Cross overreaches in trying to blame the rate increase and uh, the second step back, blame the board, really, for what's happened to its surplus. There are a lot of other reasons that its surplus has declined. This year, for example, 10 million bucks was due to their losses in the stock market. You can question whether they should have had that much in stock. And if they did have that much in stock, why did they lose 10 million? But yeah, they lost 6 million on, on their insurance business, but they lost 10 million in the stock market. That's not, so they can't blame the rate, the, the, the rate regulation system for what's happened to their surplus to the extent that they're trying to. For me, the tiebreaker is this. If this were another state where the standard was excessive, inadequate, and unfairly discriminatory, I might have more sympathy to Blue Cross's arguments than in this state, where you have to consider affordability. And we all have to have maximum solvency, but you can't have maximum solvency if you've got to consider affordability. So I, I ask the board to err on the side of Within reason, making the rate as affordable as possible. Thank you. Um, before we adjourn, um, there were some questions that the board asked that require some follow up to across. We will try and get those to you in writing so we're clear with the, the date for a response. Uh, in addition, I think there will likely be some. Um, questions from Eleni on those two points of disagreement uh, on the actuarial piece. So we'll include those as well um, and get that out this week. Thank you. Okay. Anything else before we adjourn? No? Okay, so we are adjourned um, and we're going to go over to City Hall. We'll let you know.